So we are in the middle of the series, The Elephant in the Room, today, okay? And the last week, we talked about how one of the elephants in the room, or a part of the elephant in the room, is that people today act like they're rich, when actually, as, as Heidi said, they're, they're in debt up to their eyeballs. And we talked about Proverbs thirteen seven, which says, you know, there's one person who pretends to be rich, yet has nothing, and there's another who pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. And debt is such an enormous problem in our society. It's such an enormous problem in our homes and in our church. I was thinking to myself, now, Financial Peace University is great, but I was thinking, what if there were, what if there were a, a sort of a more immediate way to avoid debt? What if there were a way, like every time we're tempted to, to go into debt or to buy something we can't afford, that, it, that something would just not let us, would prevent us from doing it? And I actually saw a commercial that goes with our, with our, uh, our series that I think might have the answer to that. Show, show, show that video. Hello. <laughs> really, Dan? Hey, guys. Hey, Dan. Hi. What's up, Dan? Are we going to talk about this? Nope. So there can be some potentially good uses of elephants in rooms. Man, if only it were that easy. Just to have somebody just knock it out of our hands. Like, don't do that, right? Um, well, I want to talk this morning about there's another elephant or another part of the elephant in the room, and that is Christians who, who sincerely want to be serious followers of Jesus, and yet they don't obey the scripture and tithe, giving 10% of their income to God. Now, when we talk about this subject of what God says about tithing and giving, we want to avoid a couple of extremes, because this is fraught with tendency to sort of go the wrong direction. One extreme that some will talk about is to think of God as sort of a vending machine. We often refer to this as sort of the health and wealth gospel or different, goes by different names. But it's this idea that the only reason we give or we give primarily is because God is going to, he's going to repay us. He's going to give us more than we gave. He's going to send us a check in the mail or, or it's all about making us rich. And God is just, his sole purpose in life is to make us healthy and wealthy. That's just absolute nonsense. But then there's the other opposite extreme, which tries to deny what the Bible says about that, you know, God does bless us. God does give us blessings, many kinds of blessings, maybe financial blessings or, or other kinds that we'll talk about. But that tendency is to sort of totally downplay the importance of giving. And we don't want to, we don't want to go to either of those extremes, because this, this idea of giving and tithing has been so abused and manipulated or used to manipulate by televangelists and all kinds of people, yet it doesn't negate what the Word of God clearly says about this issue. And so we want to we want to walk that, 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 that middle line about what, are we, what does the Bible say about, about peace and favor from God and about how our use of our resources puts us in a place to be blessed by God. And the way I like to think of this is, is very clearly that we don't talk about God as a transactional God, but a transformational God. God is not about transacting with us, sort of like a, a contract, like, like you, you rub my back and I'll wash your back, or I'll give you this if you give me that. God is much more interested in a transformational relationship, and we would call this a covenant a covenant where God just, God just wants to bless us. He wants to, to, to provide us with the things that we need, but we've, we've got to trust him. Now, according to Dave Ramsey, and, and the size of this elephant is huge. Uh, you can read different statistics. One of them uh, he often quotes is that 53% of Christians haven't given anything to their church in the last month. On the average, and so if that reflects our church, then, then that's huge. I, I don't particularly think that affects our church. I think that we're probably better than that or, or exceptional there. But, but the scope of this elephant is, is huge. Other massive studies have been done indicate that the average giving pattern of Christians is around 2% of their income to their, to their church. Dr. Craig Hood, whose books we've read in the past, says that if every Christian in America lost their jobs and yet actually tithed off of their welfare payments, contributions would rise by 35%. I mean, that's mind-boggling when you think about it. And so this week, this week, we're going to talk about the second thing 
that we just have to, we just have to do if we're going to have financial freedom and peace, and that is to give generously in the form of a tithe. Now here again, please hear my heart on this, and many of you have been here many years, you've heard me talk a lot about this, that this is not just because we want something from you. That is really not even, not even part of it. But listen, I've been doing this for long enough years, and I know in my life, and I've, and I've witnessed in the lives of so many other people, I don't want something from you, I want something for you. And, and there are things that, that, that I want for you that, that quite frankly you're not going to experience. If you, don't, if you don't tithe. then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more at the end about how, how this actually works. But I understand that tithing is, is, a, is a touchy subject. Money is a touchy subject. I get that. But especially when we talk about tithing, and people want to know, well, what is, the, like, what is the biblical basis for that? There's some arguments and debates and discussion, and I cannot get into all of those in this, in this message. But what I have done, in addition to what I'm going to be sharing this morning, I did put together a little booklet which really explores pretty much every aspect or every frequently asked question of tithing, giving 10% of your income, or generously giving of your income. And those little booklets are in the entry- entryways on the, on the uh, stand things there, and I invite you to pick one of them up and, and read it. It'll answer a lot of your questions and um, just provide a more, a more balanced context of the things that we're going to talk about. Also, I wanted to mention, some of you have already, have already found this out, on my, on my, my personal blog that I write, um, and like used to be three people got my blog, my mom, my dad, and my cat, you know, but, but others of you have, have signed up for it, and every Friday, I'm going to be putting on there some, some content to help you in this area of total financial management. I'm not a guru like Susie Orman or, or Dave Ramsey, but I've learned a lot from them and from my own life, and so I really encourage you to go to chrishiggins.org. You can put your email on there and you can get notified every Friday when I, when I put those in there. What I want to do this morning is I want to kind of examine really briefly four reasons why, why I believe that we need to tithe. And, and the first one is pretty self-explanatory and that simply is that God tells us to do it. God, God commands the people in the Old Testament to tithe. Now he does not command the New Testament Christians to tithe. But yet Jesus never negates the tithe. In fact, he reinforces it in one episode with the Pharisees. And it's just a good benchmark. It's a good point to, to sort of reference of how do we, how do we conquer this, this, this demon of, of, of materialism in our lives? And that is to give. Um, a survey by Wells Fargo a few years ago revealed that 44% of Americans claim that a discussion about personal finances is one of the most difficult discussions to have with another person. And here I am, I'm having this conversation with about 200 of you, and I'd, I'd rather like not do that, to be honest with you. I'd rather be just talk about warm, fuzzy feelings and how God loves you and have people say, Chris, you're the best pastor in the history of Christendom. Like I, I would love to have people think that of me. And yet I know that I'm much more concerned with what God wants me to say and what God wants me to share. And so as much as I understand that this is a touchy subject, understand that nobody's feeling it more right now than me, all right? So let's take a deep breath, all right? Let's try to put on a smile, and and here we go. But God does command us to tithe. Now, why does God tell us to do this? Or why does God tell us to do anything for that matter? Why? What's the deal with the Ten Commandments? Well, here's something you need to understand. That whenever God tells us to do something, he does it for two reasons. First of all, to protect us from something, but also more so to provide us with something. And so regarding our finances, he, he wants us to, to tie, to, to protect us from the obvious things that we're talking about, debt and pain and worry and struggle and sleepless nights, but more so he wants to provide us with something, a knowledge and an awareness of his amazing blessings that will provide for us, that will, that will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Now I want to look at a passage of scripture that will not surprise many of you that have been around the church for a while, but it's simply the most quintessential text to look at, and that's the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, in chapter 3. It's on page 779 uh, in the Bibles under, in the seat in front of you if you want to turn to it, but Matthew 3, or Malachi 3, 8 through 12 says this. And God is speaking to the prophet, to his people. Will a a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, well, how are are we robbing you? 
in tithes and offerings. And it says, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And so tithing in Hebrew just means a tenth. It means 10%, the first fruits that were returned to him. Well, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. The vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And then all the, na- listen, all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land. Like, is that, is that how you would describe your financial lives? A, 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 a blessed, fruitful, delightful land? Well, we learn several things from this passage. And again, the first one that I mentioned is tithing is simply a word which means 10%. The first tenth of your crops, the first tenth of your income, the first tenth. And, um, and we also learn that our tithe is to be brought into the storehouse. Now, in the Old Testament, in which Malachi is, is speaking, the Old Testament, uh, the, the storehouse was the temple. Now, in the New Testament, that's, I believe, the church, that, that the community of faith are, are to give that 10%, that tithe, the first fruits of their offering to the local church to be wise, used wisely to impact the community, to spread the gospel, to expand the kingdom, that the whole tithe would go to the faith community of which you're a part. And I know many people have asked me over the years, well, is it okay if I give maybe some to the church, but then also some of my 10% go to these other things? And, and I want to say, like, it's not not okay because this is not a legalistic law thing, but the, the scripture says that the 10% would be brought to the storehouse. And, and the Bible also speaks of tithes and offerings and, and that there are other offerings, and we'll get to that in a moment, that, that you can these other places. But I, I'm just telling you what I believe the Bible says, and that is that the 10% would come to the church. Now, Regarding our church, I want to make sure to, that you know next week we're going to be wrapping up the series, going to be talking about saving and investing and how to build wealth and the fact that God wants us to, to, to improve and wants us to, to make money. He's not, he's not opposed to it. But we're also going to talk about our Christmas offering for 2019. And, uh, and I'm going to share that with you next week. So I really want to encourage you to be here for that. But, but Malachi says, bring it into the storehouse. Bring it into the place from which you receive instruction and blessing and, and where you worship in a community of people. The other thing tithing says that we get from this passage is that, that it shows God that he's got 100% of our heart. 100% of our heart. There's a, Niger- a Nigerian proverb that said, it's the heart that gives, the, the fingers just let go. And listen, we struggle with this area. We, we tense up and we get uptight and defensive because, because our hearts don't want to let go of our money. And I, and I get that. I, I get that. I'm going to be sharing with you my journey and all this over the, over the weeks with this blog I'm writing. Many of you have heard my story before, but I understand this. I, I, I get it. I really do. But I also know that Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so when we give sacrificially, it means something. It's a very tangible way to show God, I am all in. Like I'm 100% in. Like, like, like I am your person in this place. Tithing tells God that he's number one in my life. And that's where God is supposed to be. That's why, that's why, that's why giving is, is worship. See, giving is worship. We don't necessarily primarily give to the church to pay the light bills. We don't give to the church to pay salaries. We give to God through his church. And tithing says to God, your church and you are number one in my life. And, and, and here's the deal. The, the enormous elephant in the room regarding this is simply this. That I can, like I can say I'm a Christian all I want. Like I can go on mission trips. I can stand up here and preach. I can, I can be in classes and volunteer and serve. I can read my Bible and share my faith and, and wear a Jesus t-shirt and a fish bumper sticker. But if I, but if I am not giving God total control of my money, then I'm not right with God. I would be the last, last person in the world to tell you this is easy because it is absolutely not. It's hard. It's, it's painful. And it, it, it oftentimes, as I'll talk about in a minute, isn't, isn't something that we come to easily. But here's why I feel so strongly about this. And again, this is from my experience and the experience of so many others, many, many of you out there. 
is that God absolutely promises, and we can see this in Malachi, God promises that when we, when we tithe, when we give sacrificially and generously, we will be better off on that 90% with God than on 100% without God. I absolutely guarantee, promise you that. And so here's, here's the promise that God says, this is absolutely true. He says, test me in this, put me to the test. And there are an army of people that will tell you that they have done this. They have put God to the test. Nowhere else in scripture does God say, hey, test me, test me. But this is so close to his heart, so close to, to the things that hold us back and keep us in bondage that God, God says, test me in this. And there are an army of people who will tell you that when they did that, when they, when they started giving first to God, it transformed their lives. I was talking to a couple, not long ago, business owners. They were telling me that, that until they really got serious about tithing, their business was floundering, but almost miraculously, when they started tithing, things immediately started to improve. Now, that is not a coincidence. I'll explain that in just a moment. But, 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 but not only that, but Malachi says, you know, God is going to return to us. He's going to bless in ways that we don't, maybe don't even really realize. He says, I'm going to the pest from devouring your fields. That means there's going to be some things that we're we're never even aware of that God is doing for us because we wouldn't know about it because it hasn't happened, right? But I was thinking to myself, what are some ways that that God, in in my life anyway, what are some ways that I can remember God, uh, to use a crass term, passed the test, all right? And so so in, in my life, in the lives of many others, tithe on your income and live on the remaining 90% in a godly fashion. God could do a lot of things. He could, he could give you a raise. He could sustain your health so you can keep a job. He could allow you to keep a job in the midst of a difficult economy. He could cause you and often does cause you to lose a job so that you'll get off your butt and get the job that he really wants for you. God could curb our spending impulse. He could give us the desire and the motivation to, to save He could give us the desire to get angry and weird about getting out of debt like we talked about last week. He could could and absolutely does relieve our anxiety about money. He could meet a need that arises through somebody else. He could lead us to a lifestyle that that shows how we can live on less. He could give us ideas how to make more money as I shared with you last week. He could, he could, listen, he could keep undue expenses from devouring your crops. He could keep doors open for unexpected sources of revenue. He could provide tax rebates, gifts of income, scholarships, all kinds of things. He could give the power to to help a husband and a wife work together as a team to accomplish their financial goals like we've heard Tim and Heidi talk about. He could open new doors for you to get a new job. He could help things that you own sell for a good price in a stagnant economy. He could provide the funds to further your education so that you can get a better job. All of these and so much more have happened. And we've heard many stories of that in our church. You can go to our, our First Church of Christ YouTube channel and you can re- listen to, to more faith stories about how God has just done amazing things with people as they've gotten serious about there. But again, go to verse 11. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. This is, this is the one that intrigues me the most. I think when we get to heaven, we're going we're gonna to have a whole lot of these types of situations, right? Like we're going to hear something or see something. We're going to be like, oh, how did I miss that? Like, I can't believe that wasn't God. I didn't really... Okay, that hurt. I'm sorry. I, gotta... I didn't mean to do that so hard. <laughs> okay. But he could prevent things from, from devouring our crops before they're ripe. Maybe God, like, uh, maybe God will do all kinds of crazy things. Maybe he'll keep that 1985 Yugo that you're still driving, right? Maybe he could keep that running for a little bit longer, even though it's held together with Bondo and, t- and duct tape. It's, it's still going. It's a miracle. It's a rolling miracle. Some of you have no idea what a Yugo is. That's okay. You're better off for it. But but the situation is sometimes his blessing, his favor will be in ways that we really don't, we don't realize because here's here's the simple fact about it. Like we just cannot outgive God. And that sounds like such a religious pastor cliche. But here's the thing about cliches is that they're cliches because they're most often true. They're most often true, and this one certainly is. You, you have probably, in fact, I would rather venture to bet you've never heard the name Elisha Otis, but I guarantee that you've ridden in an elevator bearing his name. The Otis Elevator Company dominates the market. Probably every time you step into an elevator, it has the name Otis on it somewhere. Now, Elisha Otis himself did not invent the elevator, but what he did rather invent was the braking system. 
You see, early elevators weren't safe and people could only go up a few stories and, and they were taking their lives in their hands when they did that. But he invented the system of, of, of breaking so to st- safely stop them when they got to the bottom. And yet people were still not convinced and they still thought that these elevators weren't safe. And so to prove his point, at the, 19, or at the 1854 Crypto Palace Expo in Manhattan, he got high in an elevator. He himself got in an elevator. And the crowd watched him from far down below when he gave the order to cut the rope. And they watched as this compartment with him in it was plunging toward the ground. And as soon as it got right above the ground, it came to a safe stop because, because of his break. His break and, and, and the Otis elevator started selling because people really began to trust its creator. And you see, in this matter of giving and tithing, it's a matter of learning to trust the creator. And that takes sometimes, oftentimes, cutting the dang rope before he can prove who he is and what he does. Now, there are, there are some people, many people, that the second they become a Christian, they just jump right in and they're tithing 10% or whatever from the start. And, and that's a great thing to do, and I encourage that. However, that is not the path that most of us have taken in this journey of giving. So what I want to do is I want to take you sort of through five stages, or five, not five levels, but there's sort of five stages in the progression that is pretty common in this area of giving. And I'm going to talk about five types of giving. And the first, the first type would be called, I'm just going to call it tip giving. Tip giving. Now, I'm not talking about 15% like you give in a restaurant, right? Like, that'd, that'd be great. Like, that's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about the mentality that is, you know, if God does something for me, maybe I'll leave him a little something. You know, if God meets my needs, if God comes through, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll give a little something. If the service is good, I'll throw a little something in the tip jar. And, and at this level, we kind of contribute sporadically or convicted. We, we begin to give. But it doesn't involve a whole lot of sacrifice at this point. And to be honest with you, even though, even though it's not a bad thing if this is where you're starting, but to be honest with you, it's largely motivated by just self-interest. Like, I, like the preacher said that I'll be better off if I give, so that's what I want to do. And, and, and that's oftentimes how, how it starts. You begin to get convicted. The Holy Spirit starts moving. You begin to give, but it's not real consistent and it's not anywhere near a tithe. And, and even though it's okay at this point, you're motivated by self. God, help me get out of this mess. God, help me get out of debt. God, I need you to do this. But it's all about a transactional sort of arrangement. It's kind of like a family that was riding home from church one day. And I know you, you can't imagine this. This would never happen in your car. But, but in this car, the parents were just complaining about the service. The, the songs were boring. The repetitive. The sermon was long and boring. And they just went on and on about how horrible the service was. The coffee was cold. And they ran out of cream. And the teachers weren't there for the kids. And went on and on about how lousy the service was. Until finally the son in the back seat had enough of it. And he piped up. He said, well, you got to admit it wasn't a bad show for a dollar, right? And so, so he evidently witnessed, witnessed the tip jar that went by, put a dollar in. The next level that often people pass to is the, the trust giving, the trust giving level. At this point, you're sort of growing. You want to do better in this area. And as you, as you do begin to give regularly and consistently and sacrificially, you do feel the, like you feel this level of giving. It is a sacrifice, but little by little, you begin to see how God truly does bless. And you see more and more as you go out in faith just how God does provide for you. And you experience, you experience these moments. These moments where unexpected blessing comes. And, and yes, even financial blessings at this point. And you wonder, is this just a coincidence? Or is God just out, is God out giving us? Is this, what, is this what we're talking about? But because you get this affirmation pretty regularly, to be honest with you, you're still mostly motivated by self-interest. Yes, you give to God, you, you want to support the church, but primarily at this point, your thoughts are still about me and my situation. But as this goes on, you decide that, hey, God, God can be trusted. And as you start to become hopefully more and more mature as a result of your steps of faith, you find over time that you start begin to think more about God and the kingdom and the mission of the church and, and missionaries and lost people. And, and more and more, you want to give to become more obedient for kingdom purposes. And then this, this often goes into the next level, and I'm just going to call this tithe giving because this is the level where a person actually, like, I'm, I'm just going to do what the Bible says to do. And even though the New Testament and Jesus don't say, hey, it's a command to give 10%, 
It's not negated by Jesus. It's still a good thing to follow. It's still what God tells us in the Old Testament. In fact, here's the deal with that. Uh, Yeah, giving is not in the New Testament. It's not an Old Testament law either. Giving was established before Moses was given the law. But in the New Testament, Paul just says that we're, we're not under the law, but we're to give as we're blessed. And we are so much more blessed than the Old Testament person because we have Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the completed scriptures. And I think that a tithe is a good response. And by this time, by this time, we're more motivated by just, I want to be obedient. I want to invest in the kingdom of God. And you, you start to seek ways not just to give a tithe, but even an offering. And more and more, you, you want to manage your money better and better. You want to get out of debt so you can invest more in the kingdom. And God continues to bless you in many different ways. And now for sure, the 90% or, or less that you're living on with God in charge is way better than when you were trying to do it 100% on your own. Tithe giving. Now, the, the, listen to me, listen to me. The next period is crucial. And this is what I'm going to call tested giving. Tested giving. You're motivated point more by the kingdom more by spreading the gospel of Christ you want to be obedient and you're not even really concerned about God do this for me or or give me this or give me that but you but you but you give a tithe and you even give an offering and and you love to give and there's a joy about it you become what Paul calls a cheerful giver and life is great the grass is green the sun is shining and God is to be praised but oftentimes friends something happens You see, you have, at this point, taken God up on his offer to test him. And he has proven himself that he is faithful. But now when you get to this stage, he's going to do some testing now. I'm not saying always, but I've seen it in my own life, and I I know it happens all the time, that God, God wants to know like, like he wants to know, are you, are you giving just because you have, have enjoyed these blessings that I'm giving? Or are you giving because of love and obedience? And what if, what if some of these affirmations that I've been giving to you, these unexpected things, and like, what if those, what if those just went away? It's like, it's like in Job when, when God said to Satan, hey, hey, check out my servant Job, how faithful he is. Satan's like, yeah, well, he's just doing that because he's, you're giving him all the stuff. You take those blessings away and he will curse you like I know he will. And so if you know the story, one by one, health, wealth, children all taken away, and it's hard. It's hard. And Job, Job, he's not a robot. He struggles for a time. But in the, in the end, he says, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, and, and God at this stage is going to want to see, will, will you say that with Job? Whatever happens, blessed be the name of the Lord. Maybe, maybe things in this stage get tight. Maybe a job situation changes unexpectedly. Or maybe it's just a season of, of difficulty. And maybe, maybe at this stage your car finally does die. That 1985 Yugo, the guy kept miraculously going, gives up the ghost. And you're like, hey, I thought, I thought, that, I can't, I thought that, that I can't outgive God. And, and here my car just died. It's God's fault. My 1985 Yugo held together with duct tape and bondo died. Like, what's going on here? But then you realize, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that I've been obedient to Scripture because what I've also done and learned from the Bible is that, that I need to have an emergency fund. And so now you can replace that 1985 you go with a much newer 1988 you go. And like you are set now. But this is tested giving. Tested giving. Now sometimes, sometimes this is kind of a, a long stage and sometimes it has many hills and valleys. Doesn't mean that God's not going to provide for your needs. This is what he wants to find out if you, if you believe that when things get really, really tight. And maybe when everything else looks to the contrary, you say, I believe God. God is, God, I'm going to, I'm going to give. God will bless me. I know it. God will provide. God will provide. But listen, this is also a season or can be a season of incredible growth and maturation as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this is, this is what God is going for. God is trying to wean us off of, a, off of personal self-interest. And so at this, at this point, we're more and more motivated by pleasing God. And then that prepares us for the, for the fifth stage of giving, the best stage of giving, a, a stage of giving that I hope that I get to one day, but I am so far away from it. But I have known people, I have known people who have hit this stage in its total heart giving. Total heart, total heart giving. 
You're so much more motivated by the mission, by the kingdom of the church, and and you give as much as you possibly can. You look for ways to invest in the kingdom, and you don't wait for them to come to you. And and like Jesus said in Matthew, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things, they'll they'll be provided for you. Like that, this is your motivation as a total heart giver. Your motivation is seeking the kingdom of God on this earth as well as the life to come. And you know, I've talked to so many people on the stage and I've observed them. People much, much, much older than I am. You see, these are these are people like older people than my 35 years old. And so I've talked to these people and I've and I've observed them. And this is what they this is what they always say. They say, Chris, I can't explain it, you know, but, but as, I, as I look back over these last 10 or 15 or 25 or whatever years, I just, I just cannot believe, I'm so amazed and so grateful how God has, has blessed me in, in so many ways. And yeah, they're, they're financially blessed usually because usually they're following the Bible's other wisdom other wisdom in managing their money. Listen, they're saving 10%, they're giving at least 10%, and they're living wisely on the 80% and not doing stupid, foolish things. But they say, I'm just, like, I'm just so overwhelmed with gratitude for God's provision. And you look back, and they, and they look back at it, and despite the massive amount of money that maybe they've given for the kingdom, and then they realize that, that they aren't blessed so much financially maybe, but, but they know that their investment in the kingdom is waiting for them. I'm going to talk more about this next week. And like Jesus said, you know, store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal for, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And at this stage, total heart giving, like you are beyond a cheerful giver. You are an elated giver. You are intoxicated on God's goodness and his blessing. And your treasure is now where your heart is. You don't even think. You don't even, you know, it doesn't even enter your mind. God, please bless me because of I'm giving. Please, please bless me, my finances. Please bless me. Please bless me. You don't even think about that because now you're just an obedient, worshipful giver. You're a cheerful giver. You're a mission-driven giver. And even though it's long since ceased to be your motivation, you realize I am such a a blessed giver. And then I think that's what this, this verse from Malachi would describe you. It would say, then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land. That is what I want for you. Okay? Hear my heart. If you give five cents or a dollar or two percent or whatever percent, you are loved, you are wanted in this church. But I want better for you. Now it just so happens that that means that we can do more ministry and we can do things, but that's not the primary motivation. My primary motivation is that you would grow as the disciple of Jesus Christ. But reach that day, one day, when you look back and you're just, you're just, blown away by God's faithfulness. And you can't wait. You can't wait to see <laughs> to see what lies in the next step. All the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land.